Hello, everyone, and welcome to Peaceful Anarchism on the Voluntary Virtues Network every Thursday at 1 p.m. And you can also find me on the theseedsofliberty.com and theconsciousresistance.com. So today we have Callan Diggs, who's a voluntarist, uh, international best-selling author of Reaching the Finish Line uh, book. And he's also a career strategist, uh, and he was featured in uh, Fast Company magazine, as well as interviews on uh, Alex Jones, Anarchast uh, with Jeff Berwick, uh, Sirius XM, and uh, countless AMFM radio stations. So uh, he's been all over. You can, uh, if you can catch him, uh, you're a lucky person. <laughs> <laughs> so he's got a he, he's got a website, reachingthefinishline.com, and uh, and and if you want to follow him on Facebook, uh, just uh, just look for him uh, by his name, Callan Diggs. So uh, Callan, thanks a lot for coming on the show. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Yeah. So, uh, so before we get into the book and uh, you know what you do with uh, with regarding the entrepreneurship, uh, can you just get into a little bit of your background, like uh, how you became a voluntarist and what got you down the path of uh, you know questioning the status quo? Sure. Uh, well, it started. Uh, I want to say uh, towards the, I would say towards the beginning of college. Uh, I guess um, I guess when I was in high school, I guess I was the typical. Uh, typical uh, liberal or or uh, Democrat, as they would call it, and uh, really I didn't know what to believe. You know, it was just more of a collectivist mindset. Okay, this is what they believe, so this means what I'm supposed to believe. And um, you know, being at a young age, I didn't really put a lot of thought into politics uh, until I got much older. And as I graduated from high school, went to college. Uh, you know, I, I got a bit more curious. I wanted to kind of uh, have a better understanding of beliefs and why and how systems work and uh, which ones were sustainable and which ones others have known to be failures. And uh, there was one guy that really made sense, and that was Ron Paul. And uh, from there, uh, I've been, I was following him. Uh, ever since he started uh, with his first campaign uh, in 2008, and I followed him all the way up until he uh, kind of uh, you know gave up uh, when his last one was successful. But he really kind of um, started me on my path uh, to uh, the message of liberty. Cool, yeah, yeah. Ron Paul, uh, yeah, he's, he's one of the the gateway drugs for a lot of. Uh Volunteers, uh, you know, uh, or an anarchist, but he doesn't really consider himself an anarchist, I guess. But so, uh, in that sense, I think he was one of the uh, most influential politicians, um, you know, that there is, <laughs> you know, spreading the true message of uh, liberty, right? So, uh, but yeah, it's really cool. Um, so, yeah, so uh, you, so you have the the book uh, reaching the finish line. Uh, so, can you give us a bit of a background of of you know that book? And yeah, there it is. <laughs> yeah. So. Yeah, so um I wrote I wrote the book because I was getting overwhelmed. Uh, it came to a point where I was getting uh, 25 emails a day. People asked me to personally work with them, and uh, eventually I, I couldn't. It was, it was only one of me. I couldn't. Uh, I, I didn't have that time to devote to those people. So I figured it'd be best just to write a book, and that's what I did. So I wrote the book Reaching the Finish Line. Um, and the book has been an international bestseller. I uh, ha- had a lot of uh, great feedback from the book uh, so far, and uh, that's and basically the book is a result of years and years of work of me uh, being able just helping people. Uh, my prior business experience, uh, my prior experience in the trenches, as far as being in uh, several uh, cities all across the U.S., just kind of just trying to get get in the feel of the U.S. the economy and. Um, just kind of measure up to see if what mainstream media was saying was actually accurate or not. So uh, with all that experience and putting it all together, I wrote the book. And the book uh, basically uh, helps people to be able to reach the finish line in their careers. So you have three types of people. Uh, the first type you have are people who hate their job. And unfortunately, only 30% of Americans like their job. Uh, so you know, obviously they want to get out their job uh, and probably to a job that aligns more with their passion, something that could, they could look forward to going to work to every day so they can feel more fulfilled. Do you have the second group who, uh, you know, they're in a job, but they want to be their own boss. So they, make, they want to make the transition uh, to be an entrepreneur, but, um, you know, uh, for, for, some, for some people it may be a, a bit more tedious than others, but that's the second group of people. And the third group of people, are people who are entrepreneurs, but they're struggling, you know. So, so they are their own boss, and they're probably making, let's say, I don't know, like a uh, fifteen, sixteen hundred dollars a month. But they want to make more. They want to scale. Uh, they they, they want to have more uh, increased volume of business, and uh, I help those people as well. So, uh, those are type of three, those those like my three target uh, demographics of people that I usually work with. 
Awesome, awesome. So, so before uh, before you wrote the book, you had you also had background starting various businesses uh, yourself as an entrepreneur. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, uh, it, mostly uh, it was in real estate. So uh, that was that was kind of uh, that was that was the majority of my background. Uh, my grandfather uh, was in business. Uh, he used to uh, basically uh, uh, offer corporate corporate consulting to a lot of Fortune 500 companies. So he used to kind of um, help businesses to be able to improve um, their bottom line, uh, so they could be more more successful uh, in a profit margin so they could uh, retain more employees um, and basically the business could be uh, obviously a, 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 a attractive employer uh, to the public so uh, from there uh, you know learn, learning for a while learn from him it kind of gave me a kind of gave me an idea kind of where to go and uh, I kind of started uh, as a young person uh, as a teenager uh, it was quite funny because um, I was actually giving career advice to uh, people that was going to my father and uh, people, they, they used to laugh at me they was like you know why should I listen to you you know you're a <laughs> Enough to be my son, <laughs> um, but a, a lot of that knowledge was from my grandfather. But uh, but uh, th th eventually, that started to have a lot of uh, results with people. People started, you know, seeing great results, and uh, from there, uh, it was something that I knew that was working. And then when a great recession happened, uh, really, I felt like it was a great opportunity to really persist with it. I didn't do it full time. Um, I had a, uh, I, I, I found I started a real estate company, uh, so I was also doing that. So I was kind of doing it like kind of dual. I was kind of ha I had this one aside and I had the other one. Um, I was doing it as well. So, um, but eventually, uh, you know, real estate is great and I, I enjoy it. I still invest in real estate passively, but uh, I really wanted to do this uh, as far as uh, help people through the reach the finish line in a career full time, and that's what I did. And kind of after me writing a book, uh, that's what it became more like me just focus on this full time and uh, I was successfully able to sell that real estate company. Wow, Sounds, that's beautiful. Yeah, I mean, yeah. Uh, yeah, I'm always encouraging people to be entrepreneurs. It's like, um, I think I, I remember reading that uh, in the early 20th century, uh, something like 95% uh, of people are were entrepreneurs and 5% were employees. And today it's virtually the opposite. <laughs> yeah, uh, very little entrepreneur. Like, like everybody, most people have it in their mind. You know, okay, I'm going to go to school. I'm going to go to college, get my degree, and then get a job with somebody, <laughs> right? With a big co company, big corporation, and uh, and you know, with their 401k and their, or you know, they feel comfortable, right? And they don't want to, yeah. they don't want to. It's their comfort job, right? And so, like you said, there's people that hate their job, but they're willing to sacrifice their comfort for their their their, their uh, I guess happiness for a slight bit of security, right? Yeah. But, so, you, so I'm sure you meet those kind of people, right? Oh, all the time. Um, you know, I, 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 hear, I always hear, I probably hear millions of times of how people hate their job and, and that's unfortunate, but I really, uh, some people aren't willing to make sacrifices and that's what keeps them in their job, you know? Yeah. And, um, and so I kind of help people to be able to kind of, you know, reach their finish line, their careers to whatever that is ideal for them. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I mean, uh, it, it's a, it's an amazing amount of um, risk and sacrifice uh, that you have to that you have to make as an entrepreneur. You know, there's no security, right? Your business could fail. You know, pe people could stop coming to you, right, for whatever reason. Um, you know, it's it's largely dependent on reputation, right? You know, you uh, you treat customers badly, they're gonna complain to other people or you know some online forum, and there goes your reputation. <laughs> you know, yeah. so quickly, yeah. right? Maybe something that you took it took you years and years to build up. And, you know, a couple of people just complaining and, you know, talking to other people. It's just it's amazing how quickly that could shatter. Right. Yeah, I mean, but you look at you look at the other side of the coin. I think it's just as bad, uh, you know, when you're an employee. Right. Uh, you right. have to you have to be you know you're being told what to do, and uh, whether you like the guy or not, you have to do it. So, yeah. you, so you can hate your boss. You can right. think he's an idiot, or you could probably use uh, uh, some other colorful words if you wanted to for the <laughs> for the employer. But uh, but and, and then too, uh, your your paycheck is limited. So your right, paycheck right. has a cap. You right. might get a raise, and you may get another raise, but right. You may get capped out, so yeah. uh, you could be working uh, 40, 50, 60 hours uh, for the rest of your life yeah. and, uh, with a salary that you're not proud of. Yeah, 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 exactly. I mean, I mean, uh, e but still, even even with all that risk, and and actually, you know, me studying, um, you know, volunteerism and uh, and, and anarcho capitalism and uh, Austrian economics, I've really gained a, an appreciation for entrepreneurs. You know, a much deeper appreciation than I previously had because I realized that. The people that put their neck on the line in order to create value, 
to uh, to people, to customers, and then grow their business, and then they create jobs, and then people are attracted to them. They want to work under them. You're like those are the people that really create the wealth in a society. You know, they they create that uh, high standards of living that we all appreciate, that we all take for granted. <laughs> you know, when people complain of capitalism, you know, they are taking for granted the high standard of living and the leisure that capitalism has brought them through these uh you know these uh, enterprising and uh and risk taking entrepreneurs <laughs> yeah it's just um i feel like you know people still could be an entrepreneur they just have to get away from all the noise like when it comes to places like silicon valley and yeah. places like new york city uh, there are tons of people that's trying to get venture capital or you're trying to get into accelerators or incubators and uh really those type of environments is what discourage people from being an entrepreneur because they say, "Well, you know, look at all these people competing for that money. You know, I can't be an entrepreneur." Mm-hmm. But there's a lot of there's a lot of um, uh, cities that are rising as far as becoming kind of entrepreneurial hubs. Uh, like uh, there's one there's one uh, Columbus, Ohio. So Austin has Austin, Texas has uh, kind of uh, kind of you know uh, been one of rising. Uh, uh, hubs for entrepreneurship but when it comes to incubators when it comes to accelerators but uh, that's starting to get overcrowded just like uh, Silicon Valley now but uh, Columbus Ohio um, they're starting to uh, create a lot they're starting to uh, promote a lot of their uh, incubators and accelerators and a lot of investors are investing uh, in, in that type of city because they see a lot of innovation a lot of tech uh, coming out of that as well so people that want to be entrepreneurs they I think they just should be looking in different places you know you know try, try to look away from the Silicon Valley from the New York City from the places like Austin because uh, really unless you're unless the person is tenacious and uh, they're going to be relentless uh, uh, most likely they're going to be disappointed. Can you explain some of those terms you used? You said incubator and uh, what were the other terms? Acceler- yeah, accelerator. Yeah. yeah, can you explain some of those terms? Yeah, for sure. So um, an accelerator is where uh, basically you, uh, you you have an entrepreneurial idea um, and uh, a lot of investors like it and uh, they will accept your idea. But what they would do is you have to sell a piece of your company. So basically, it would be like an equity stake. It would be like a, um, you know, for example, you may sell five percent of your company, mm-hmm. okay, for them for exchange for them to help you and build your company up so you can be successful. Right. Okay, that's accelerator. Mm-hmm. Uh, incubator is more like uh, where. Um, Sort of a group of a group of seasoned professionals, sometimes retired people, uh, they sort of provide like a, a school or provide like a learning format to kind of build you up as an entrepreneur and to kind of and kind of you know craft you as an entrepreneur. You know your company, your elevator pitch, so that way when you approach a, a venture capitalist, you can be able to raise money. Okay, very nice. Uh, so so when people come up to you and they they say you know, Callan, uh, I'm thinking about uh, going to college. <laughs> you know, what do you think I should study? Like, like, what what is your response to them who you know th- thinking about people thinking about going to university? Well, it really depends on uh, what they plan on studying. Mm-hmm. So, uh, if they don't know what they want to study, uh, maybe they shouldn't go to college just yet. Mm-hmm. Uh, perhaps taking a gap year uh, that could be very beneficial. Uh, traveling, uh, you know, to uh, either various states or different countries can uh, give them some time to think about it, as well as it can uh, give them some perspective, some clarity. And with maybe within a year to have a better idea what they want to study, or what they can do is they can study something like liberal arts, and where they can just uh, start taking general education courses for the first two years, and then perhaps after that, uh, maybe they have a better idea what they want to study for their final two years, or if they decide, hey, you know, I don't like college, at the very least, I have an associate's degree in liberal arts. But uh, but it really depends, you know, like specialized uh, careers, they should definitely go to college. I mean, no no hospital is going to hire you as a doctor if you don't have a doctor's degree. Right, right. Uh, <laughs> yeah. And, um, but at the same time, if you want to be a, let's say, a, 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 mu- a music teacher mm-hmm. or a musician, uh, you don't have to go to college for that. Uh, there's a lot of tuition-free programs like the Curtis Institute of Music or the Yale School University uh, or the Yale University School of Music, and where basically all you have to do is audition for a position, uh, a spot to be able to learn from renowned musicians. And if you pass the audition, you basically get tuition-free access to learn from renowned musicians. And that's just one example. I mean, they have similar programs for art and other programs. Programs, but those programs will, uh, will, uh, will will help you avoid from becoming a student loan debt victim. Oh yeah, big time. That's uh, 
Yeah, that's the major thing that people um, so willingly take. It's it's amazing how you know people are they're scared of credit card debt, <laughs> but some of them you know they don't even know what they want to study. Like you just said, they're just doing liberal arts or just going to university. You know, I'll probably figure it out when I get there. But in the meantime, they're getting like fifty thousand dollars, hundred thousand dollars in debt, and it's like you're digging yourself into a hole. And when you leave, you really have nothing to show for it. And again, no guarantee that you're even going to get a job in your field, which most of the time uh, I hear like like something like uh, 60, 70 percent of them don't even get a job in their field when they leave college. And, and it's just tragic. And, and most of them, I think, get jobs that do not require college education at all. <laughs> you know, Bar- Barnes and Noble, Starbucks, Home Depot, yeah. Lowe's, you know, Dunkin' Donuts. And it's just really, really tragic. And, uh, you know, it's just a waste of time, waste of money, waste of resources. Uh, and I also think that the internet, uh, I, I'm sure you've noticed this too, that the internet has, has made uh, possible so many possibilities that before were, never, were not there. You know, it's just, you know, lightning fast transmission of ideas, just, you know, just, you know free, free long distance calls like Skype. <laughs> you, know, yeah. you know, how many different ways can you learn on the internet? And, and not even that, but how many different colleges and universities offer their stuff for free? Uh-huh you know online like like what was it like mit and yeah like right a lot of them offer their their courses online for free <laughs> it's just i don't know it's just it's just amazing how people still still seem to think that college and universities is the only way and if you don't go that way you're going to be a failure you know? yeah i mean uh I, I i really i really applaud a lot of the universities you spoke about mit and you and um and Stanford as far as having these um, open courseware courses where it allows students to be able to take the courses for free. I mean, they, they won't they won't get a grade, but yeah. uh, they can take the course for free and still get the same um, education. So right. I like the direction that's going in. Uh, my podcast, I, I recently interviewed uh, Shai Reshef, and Shai Reshef is the founder and president of the University of the People, which is the uh, first uh, accredited U.S. tuition-free university in the United States, and um, and, I, and really like uh, I really like his model because uh, it's the, the the university is not absolutely free. You have to pay for exams, you have mm-hmm. to pay for enrollment costs, but you're not paying for tuition. So with with a, a model like his, like for a bachelor's degree, uh, you'll pay two thousand dollars. For I mean, for a associate's degree, you'll pay two thousand dollars. For a bachelor's degree, you'll pay four thousand mm-hmm. dollars. But uh, that that's so affordable that uh, people won't be able to go into student loan. People won't be able to incur student loan debt because um, it's is at a price where most people can afford. Yeah, yeah, and, it, and it's and it's really sad when when people look at other countries like um, you know like like France and Spain and Italy, you know, uh, and Brazil. I think where you know they say that college is free. But uh, of course, you know it's not free. <laughs> There's always going to be some cost because, because people are working. There's resources being used, and so as long as people are working, somebody has to pay for that, or somebody has to pay them, right? So if you're not paying for it directly, you can you can be damn sure that it's coming out of your paycheck. <laughs> you know that much more uh, than uh, than if it, if it was charged to you directly, right? So so yeah. it's unfortunate that people have this idea that you know labor should be for free. Wait, what? <laughs> That, yeah. doesn't make, that doesn't make sense. <laughs> Go ahead. And, and that's what Shai is doing. Um, like, the university is a nonprofit organization. Yeah. And, um, you know, it's, no one's getting taxed. Yeah. Uh, simply what it is is, like, people from NYU, people from Columbia, a lot of these prestigious universities, they volunteer their time to wow. be a part of this university. So nice. it allows students to be able to learn and study uh, with uh, f- with uh, prestigious uh, professors and also get a quality and uh, accredited uh, education. Yeah. And with that, with that university, the only thing the, uh, the student has to pay is an uh, end of exam fee. So every course have a, have a, uh, a final exam. Mm. And basically that's $100. But like I said, for a whole bachelor's degree program, that's only four thousand dollars. You know, yeah. uh, that rivals any. Uh, I mean, well, that supersedes any uh, uh, bachelor's degree in the U.S. Most bachelor's degrees in the U.S. you'll pay anywhere between forty, sixty, eighty thousand dollars. Oh yeah. A four thousand dollars bachelor's degree that's pretty much unheard of. So I really commend him for, um, step, um, you know, being one of the pioneers for that. So, so that, so that has um, absolutely no like government involvement. Like, like that's all volunteer work. You said. Absolutely, it's a nonprofit organization. Wow, that's really yeah, awesome. So, uh, so government is not involved uh, yeah, whatsoever. There's awesome. no, there's no financial aid. There's wow. no health grants. Wow. There's no uh, Sally May or Stafford. Uh, <laughs> and it's the thing about uh, university of people. Let's say, 
let's say a person don't even have four thousand mm-hmm. dollars, or let's say a person can't afford to let's say pay a four hundred dollars or eight hundred bucks uh, per uh, uh, tri semester, they even have scholarships. Mm-hmm. You know, if you can't even afford to pay that, so uh, it's it's a it's a great business model, and I really hope universities kind of go in that direction mm-hmm. uh, rather than making it uh, so expensive. Yeah, I mean, and and I, I don't I don't really uh, blame the universities either because it's you know I, I try to explain to people like if you had a business, and the government says we're going to pay you regardless if you treat your customers right, <laughs> regardless if you make a good quality product, we're going to pay you now. Now, what is the incentive? Is the incentive to lower your price <laughs> or of raise your not. price, <laughs> right? So so to me, it's just like uh, you know it's the natural result of human action when when given you know secured funds through taxation. It's just it's just natural, like you know, astronomical skyrocketing. Cause same thing happening in healthcare, you know, astronomical. And people, some people think it's going to be better when Obamacare comes in, but <laughs> I don't think so. <laughs> it's like this. Go, ahead, go ahead, go ahead. Yeah, yeah, and uh, that's what I'm saying. Like, uh, you know, see, see, that's the thing I talk about a lot, Dan. You know, everyone wants to look. To something else, they want to look to government, right, right. or they want to look to religion. You know, mm-hmm. essentially, it's within here. It's within you. Mm-hmm. You know, that's you reach the finish line by starting in here. Mm-hmm. You know, a lot of people want to always look externally, but they don't want to look internally. Yeah. And it starts internally before you can go externally. So, uh, the, the 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 people that always you know look to government for problems, and the people always look to um, uh, you know those type of entities, they're they're never going to be happy because they're always going to be chasing the rabbit. Right. Can, can yeah. you can you give me some examples of uh, of you know some of your recent clients that uh, that you helped uh, start their business just to get an idea? Yeah. So uh, there, there's there's a very popular one. Uh, one story that I'm proud of. Um, you know, it was a uh, her name is Maida, and she was a uh, very and she was uh, she, uh, basically a mom that had a daughter, and uh, they uh, they moved to Houston. Now um, uh, they you know uh, th- there's a lot of uh, there's a lot of how you say. Uh, I guess a political debate about the legal and illegally, but you know mm. she came here. Mm-hmm. You know whether she came here legally, or illegally, I don't care. <laughs> but um, <laughs> it's, it's not important anyway. <laughs> the fact was she came here right. and she didn't speak and she didn't speak a uh, very very good English. Uh, I did live abroad before, so I spoke Spanish, so I was able to communicate with her, and uh, she didn't have a lot of skills. But uh, one thing I was able to. One, one thing um, that I was able to do with her uh, was eventually to work with her. But at that point in time, the only job she was able to get was working at McDonald's. And, you know, uh, that's not a very, you know, that's not a very uh, lucrative job or position. It's mm-hmm. kind of it's kind of the bottom of the barrel. Mm-hmm. And uh, she said she wanted to do something better. But she only had 10th grade uh, education, mm-hmm. you know. So she, she, didn't even, she didn't even graduate from high school. Mm-hmm. So uh, basically while I worked with her, I said, okay, well, Let's create a LinkedIn profile for you, you know, because, you know, obviously, you know, you have a daughter, you don't have time to go back to school, and then you're working about 50 hours, 55 hours at McDonald's. Mm. So the most practical thing I could do for her and help her out was build a LinkedIn profile. Mm. So basically, she built a LinkedIn profile, she had a professional picture. Uh, basically, I kind of leveraged some of my connections to kind of help her out. Uh, but she also had a few people that she knew, and she slowly built that profile, and then she started getting endorsements. Uh, she started getting out recommendations, mm-hmm. and a lot of those, a lot of those things really helped your LinkedIn profile. So when you do apply for jobs, or you look for positions, and a, perspe- a prospective employer look at your profile, that can definitely uh, give you some credibility, give you some leverage. So um, I had her do that for about uh, six months, every single day, fifteen minutes on LinkedIn, every single day, and uh, eventually uh, she was able to land a position at a uh, accounting uh, accounting firm. Uh, basically, she was a secretary. She was kind of not very complex work, but she was able to get a job there, which was mm-hmm. which was very excited for her. But she went from making eight dollars an hour to fourteen dollars an hour. Oh, nice. Now, now, um, you know, Dan, that's not a huge success story, yeah. but for a person who doesn't have a high school diploma, right, right. you know, and for her, she was very happy because she was barely able to prov- she was she, she was barely able to keep her head above water as right. far as paying all her bills. Yeah. That was really a big boost for her. Wow. So um, so in, in that situation I, you know I was able to help her to uh, find her a career that she was uh, much more happy with. Awesome. Awesome. Yeah. I mean yeah. it's it's uh, baby steps. I mean uh-huh. I mean I, I uh, <laughs> even when somebody tells me they're uh, they're a high school dropout. I mean, uh, actually, I consider that a, a, a notch like in in their in their favor <laughs> because it's like the less time we spend in public school, 
the less time is wasted, <laughs> you know, learning things that are useless, right? Because the way I look at it is like, it's like 12 years spent in, in, in government school. If, if we were really learning useful skills, I would think that after 12 years, we, we would, you know, people could do more than a minimum wage job, flipping burgers or pushing buttons or, yeah. you, know, you know, filling coffee drinks. I mean, it just, it's just kind of pitiful that, that, you know, people, we still value that kind of education. But, you know, they're basically the bottom of the barrel. Like, like you know, the government, <laughs> you know, I, I, the way I look at it is like the government tries to disguise the fact that they really don't have any skills by imposing this minimum wage on, on these, uh, you, know, you know, employers saying, you know, you can't pay this, this you know, below this or, you can, or else, it's, you know, you're going to be fined or whatever. <laughs> but, yeah. yeah. And that part is ridiculous. Um, uh, uh, Seattle is uh, uh, Seattle is really, I guess, leading the way when it comes to that whole fifteen dollars hour minimum wage. And, oh, oh, uh, yeah. The mayor, the mayor passed the law, and now uh, it's it's it, it's not in full effect, but it's basically it, it's kind of a, a gradual effect. So I, I believe about twenty seventeen, mm. it will actually be uh, fifteen uh, fifteen dollars an hour. Mm. But the thing about it is, you know, not only does it hurt small business, but what do you say when you're paying your employees? And at, uh, you know, a- after you pay all your employees, you- your employees end up making more money than you. Like that's not how business works, you know. Mm-hmm. But but those type of laws, that's what that's it, it, eventually it hurts small businesses, you know. It forces small business owners to go out of business because yeah. they have to pay their employees. But by the time they have the money left over for themselves, it's actually less than what their employees are making. Right, right, right. That's the whole idea. Is uh, you know, with basically with any government program, you know, it it. The, what it what the projected uh, or or what the uh, what the stated goal is uh, usually the exact opposite occurs, right? So the war on poverty creates more poverty. You know, the war on terror yeah. creates more terrorists. Yeah. <laughs> and minimum wage laws trying to help the um, you know the lesser experience actually destroy their potential because it cuts off the rungs on the ladder for them to start out with and get experience and and uh, you know maybe do an internship. Uh, like like I remember uh, I, I I saw this one John Stossel video and and he was talking to a couple of the uh, his I guess guys his age like in their fifties and sixties and they were basically saying the jobs that they did when they were young the first jobs that they did are legal today, <laughs> <laughs> which is hilarious. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You know, like uh, I, I mean I mean and, and people still like you know clamoring for politicians like you said in Seattle and various other places raise the yeah. minimum wage you know and and uh, and like people in McDonald's right in various states same thing like raise the minimum we we deserve a living wage right and when they don't realize well you know what if you if they really instituted that you're going to be thrown out and a machine is going to replace you because the machine can work without lunch without lunch breaks without bathroom breaks without vacation right? yeah yeah and, and, and the, the thing I have is people always say, you know, like, you know, I, I hear all this, pay me what I'm worth, pay me what I'm worth. Right, and I, hear, right, I, hear that, right. I hear that a whole lot. And the thing about it is, like, there's nothing wrong with giving employee, employees raises, you know. Mm-hmm. I mean, of course, if an employee does a good job, reward mm-hmm. them, you give them a raise, and it gives them a incentive to stay with your company and do, and do quality work. Right. But a lot of people, they want $15 an hour, but they're mediocre employees. <laughs> You know, and and I'll give you, I mean, okay, don't get me wrong. Like, when you take California, okay, maybe you can make a, a maybe you can make an argument with fifteen dollars an hour because the cost of living there is very expensive. Uh-huh. You know, but when you take when you take a state where the minimum wage is seven dollars an hour, and then you're asking for fifteen dollars an hour, and then you know, basically, you're an average employee, or you don't, or you don't show your employer that you that you're worth more money or that you're a quality employee. You don't give no incentive for an employee to pay you more money. So, so I, I think a lot of people have this entitlement mentality that oh, oh well, you know, I, I deserve more money even though i'm not going to give of more of myself Mm -hmm. to show my my boss that i'm worth more right right it's it's not about like appealing to your politician to pass a law to force your employer to pay you more maybe you should make yourself more valuable maybe you should learn new skills maybe you should (laughs) maybe start a business of your own if you want to yeah you think 15 dollars uh is a living wage start a business of your own pay people 15 dollars an hour do it yourself stop appealing to you know politicians to force people to do what you think is right that's the whole you know immorality and, and the thing is like you know people people do a lot of complaining well if you accept the job well that's your responsibility because you accept the seven dollar an hour job mm-hmm. you know i mean there's there's employers all across the country like for example you know i've helped several people um um, as far as uh, kind of help people get careers up there in the back in the back in uh, region, and I'm, I'm not sure you're familiar with that dam, but that's up there in North Dakota, Western okay. North Dakota, okay. where there's a huge oil boom. Okay. And uh, now, 
these companies have nothing to do with the government, but they are desperate for employees. And as long as a person has the physical aptitude, uh, they'll pay an employee anywhere between twenty to thirty dollars an hour entry level. That means you don't have to have no, no college degree, nothing. They just, like I said, they want they want employees that has the physical aptitude that can do the work. You know, it's very, it's very tedious work, but if they can do the work, they pay well. And like I said, that's nothing to do with the government, and uh, it's just it's just the private sector. Right, you know, that's right. the way they want to attract employees because you know it's, it's a very hard labor job, but at the same time they the companies are willing to pay well. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I mean, uh, I mean, it's like you know, people say you know, pay me what I'm worth. It's like, well, well, what about like uh, you know, movie stars? Like they get you know, millions of dollars per movie. Like, are they getting paid what they're worth? I think so. <laughs> it's like, can you do? Yeah. <laughs> can you can you be Brad Pitt in his movies? You know, no. There's only yeah. one Brad Pitt, and he's paid yeah. millions of dollars because that's his value. <laughs> that's what he's contributing. And if you can do that, then do that. And if you yeah. can't, then maybe it's your problem. Maybe you need to learn more skills and stop blaming your employer for, again, like you said, for a job that you voluntarily uh, signed up for. <laughs> uh-huh. <laughs> you know, Absolutely. Yeah, I mean, there's a lot. There's lots of great employers um, out there that pay very well. And uh, when it comes to the criteria as far as uh, being hired as an employee, uh, all those um, all those uh, criteria for those employers are not always high. You know, uh, there, there's there's a lot of um, employers that will allow you to work from home. Uh, there's uh, there's several employers that will. They will offer you unlimited pay time off, or they call it unlimited vacation, or they call it open pay time off. Uh, there's a lot of employers that have different models, but it goes back to the private sector. It has nothing to do with government. So if a person is really diligent and they want to they wanna make more money or they want to have a more enjoyable uh, work life, well, those companies are out there. You just have to look for them. Yeah, 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 yeah. And uh, <laughs> I heard another uh, interesting analogy about the minimum wage. It's like, it's like you know those the guys that say in the um, in the dating uh, you know the dating scene, the guys that can't get the women, they're the kind of guys that would want to uh, you know clamor to their politicians. I want a minimum sex law passed so that I <laughs> get minimum. You know, <laughs> it's illegal for me not to have sex, <laughs> like, right? So it's the peop- oh. it's the people that don't get it. It, that, that that basically don't deserve it. Maybe they they're not they're not impressing women. They they don't they don't know how to talk to women. They don't know <laughs> interpersonal skills. <laughs> you know? I sure hope it doesn't go that far. <laughs> <laughs> I mean I mean it's funny, but but that's essentially the same thing. It's like you know in the dating market, you know you know people don't get together because they're forced to get together, like because by yeah. law or by regulation. No, people get together because you want to spend time with another person, right? It's completely yeah. voluntary, completely consensual, and it's basically it's anarchy. You know, the anarchy is in the dating world. So it's the same thing with uh, you know with with businesses. You know, I mean, I'm sure maybe there's some employers that are like maybe don't treat their employees well. Well, then maybe they're going to lose employees and their business is going to suffer. It's like that, that yeah. right? That doesn't mean that you 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 you, you clamor to politician to institute more violence against him you know you just say okay i'm not going to work for you i'm going to find someplace else <laughs> it's a simple solution you know social ostracism i think is a great solution to these problems that people feel like only the government can solve right for sure and I, i'm glad you brought that up because kind of going to uh how how why uh, employers can't keep uh, employees and um what what a lot of employers are trying to do is they're finding finding find new ways that they can increase employee retention and uh one way as i spoke about earlier is called unlimited pto which is unlimited paid time off and a lot of uh, companies like twitter carmax prezi uh sail through uh what they do is uh uh, basically, you know, as, as as long as long as the employee uh, demonstrates their quality work and that they're a good asset to the company, um, the employer wants the employee to feel well rested. They want to have a good sense of well being. So they allow their employees uh, to take as uh, many days off as they want to, as long as they're getting their projects done at work. Right, right, right. So and I think that's wow. a great incentive. That's nice. Yeah. <laughs> oh shoot, that's very nice. Yeah, you know, you know, I just remembered, uh, you know, back going back to McDonald's, I, um, I actually, you know, I used to work as, as an acupuncturist in a car accident clinic, and and we we treated mostly um, uh, Hispanic people, and a lot of them did have, I guess, you know, minimum wage jobs, right? And a lot of them that did work in McDonald's, you know, stuff like that, I would, ask, I like to ask them, like, do you like your job? Do you enjoy your job? Right? And most of them do. Actually, the you know the ones that I talk to, most of them say, yeah, actually they treat me pretty well, and especially because 
uh, you know, when they come over here and they don't speak English much, you know, it's only those jobs that are still willing to hire them. And because they don't necessarily have to be expert in English to work at those jobs, right? And they basically learn English on the spot, right? And on, on the job, and and they gain valuable skills as a result. So they're actually grateful. For, for, yeah, for and, and, and now let's talk more earlier. Ma- Maida, the, uh, the right, person right. now, she started at McDonald's. Yeah, you yeah. know, like I said, her her English wasn't good. Yeah, and um, that was that it was that was a, the, kind of one of the few employers that that was willing to give her a chance. Yeah, yeah. So so it's yeah. really it's really amazing, and I think people tend to forget the value that these kind of companies add to society like you know when they when they're always trying to look for laws and regulations to rein in these evil capitalists and make sure there's no exploitation where you know whereas you have to realize that you know actually a lot of people go there because they want to work there not because they're forced to work there but because they want yeah. to work there you know nobody's forced like it's not it's you know it's a fundamental difference between that and slavery is it's consensual you, you you know you have a contract you know you fill out the form the paperwork you you read all the stipulations and then you sign on the dotted line right that's consensual it's not yeah. it's not exploitation like the moment you feel exploited okay you tell your boss and if he doesn't do anything about it then you can leave you know you have other choices you're not bound to stay there right so yeah and, and that's and that's what people need to do you know if they don't like how much money they're making they need to do more due diligence you know do some googling and look out there and see what other employers are are willing to pay more and, and perhaps offer a lower bar of entry, and sometimes they may have to be flexible and move, you know. But uh, if making more money is really what they want to do, or is really what they want to have in their life, then that's something they should consider. But to complain and expect government to change things and turn things around, I mean, they, they could be waiting for the rest of their life for that. And like I said, I mean, it's not the government's job to do that, right. you know. It's uh, it's it's. If anything, if a person wants to be more attractive as a candidate, they need to work on their skill set. Well, like I said, uh, if they do have a skill set uh, and they're still struggling, like I said, there's lots of employers out there. Uh, you know, you know, the economy is booming in Texas. Economy is booming in North Dakota. Uh, there's lots of other. Uh, there's lots of other cities uh, where uh, there's booming economies that people can find these jobs. As I was talking about before, there's work at home employers, and where you could you could get paid twelve, thirteen, fourteen dollars an hour from just staying at your home and you know having having this headset and maybe having to have a cell phone and uh, doing that as well and again you know if a person let's say you know you know they don't they don't want to work as hard they don't like 40 hour work weeks well you can refer to those jobs that offer uh, unlimited uh, paid time off and so that's what i'm saying there's so many there's so many options it's just i feel like the easy and the lazy way out is to complain about it and to expect government to change to change things around for you Right, right, right. It's like yeah. it's like you know when I tell people that you know maybe you should build up the skill set. Maybe you should, and and there are simple. So no government should take care of it. <laughs> That's yeah. a simple solution. And I'm like, wait, no, 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 no. Stop, stop deflecting. You know your own uh, shortcomings or your own weaknesses, and you know you should you should confront them, right? And you should you know say you know maybe maybe I need to learn something new. Maybe I can offer you know a different company something better. And it's my problem, really. It's not my employer. It's not that my employer is evil. <laughs> you know, it's not. You know, maybe he's actually trying to struggle to get you know all the things that he's trying to uh, to deal with. You know, all the expenses and all the decision making that he's trying to deal with. You know. Maybe that's that's really what he's worried about. He's not really trying to exploit me, <laughs> yeah. you know. Like people right. have this idea that uh, you know that the guy above him, you know, like like these uh, you know these um, uh, these CEOs, you know, they're just sitting in their offices, playing solitaire, making <laughs> you know hundreds of thousands of dollars, and they're not yeah. doing anything, and we're doing all the work. Well, you know what? I mean, the way I tell people is like. You know, if you work in, let's say, you know, somebody's working at, a, at like a minimum wage job like McDonald's, right? And you make a mistake, you know, let's say you make a big mistake and you cost the company, let's say, a couple hundred dollars. And then you need such a bad mistake that they fire you. Okay, so that's one job and, and they can rehire somebody and they just lost, you know, a couple hundred dollars. A CEO in charge of thousands of jobs <laughs> and hundreds of thousands of dollars of, uh, of capital makes a mistake you know, hundreds of thousands of dollars are lost. <laughs> Tens of thousands of jobs are sacrificed. Like that's a major. Uh, that's that's. I think that's worth <laughs> what they're getting paid. You know, yeah. for, the, for the most part. So, what do you think? I agree. <laughs> it's yeah. So um, so I, you know, it's, it's it's helpful for people to put it into perspective. You know, because you know, it's like a lot of people, especially like the Occupy Wall Street people. You know, they got this this idea of you know Marxist. Uh, you know, Marxist. Uh, 
uh, exploitation and you know you know it's like uh, you know whatever what do they say like all about equality i mean i mean actually a lot of people that study economics you know because i talk about economics with a lot of people and some people who study economics in university what they learn is marxist economics right and so basically they they're learning all about like um it's more uh, like uh what do you call it keynesianism keynesianism yeah 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 yeah, that's 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 um yeah, that's a little. I think that's like in the middle, and then even further. In the middle, okay. Yeah, in the further is like Marxist economics, where they're talking more about like uh, worker-owned uh, companies, which uh-huh. which there are a lot of worker-owned companies, but they're just not really that successful. They're not really big because yeah. you know it's like it's like the way I look at it. If you were to put the decision-making process in the hands of the minimum wage job of you know minimum wage worker that the CEO has the experience to make, I think that company is going to suffer. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, time. yeah, and, and you know the Occupy Wall Street people, the people who uh, the pay me what I'm worth people, all those people. Like, I understand their frustrate their frustrations, yeah. but their solution is not is, is the wrong way to go about it. Right, you know, right. because because it's like okay, okay, so, okay. Let's say they get paid fifteen dollars an hour. Okay, well inflation. Well, let's okay, they can pay fifteen dollars an hour, and then there is inflation. Well, eventually, well since there is inflation, and, and um and since the since since what they make and if the if the cost of living goes up, well. That's, that's going to put in the back gunner. So what they have to do again? Ask the government for another raise. So it's going right. to be thirty dollars an hour, right, and then right. what's going to keep going up and up like that? It's it's again. It's it's not it's not practical. It's not sensible. I think it's just like I said. It's best if if uh, the employee or the person who's interested in making more money yeah. uh, just uh, look to the private sector because like I said, there's lots of employers mm-hmm. uh, who are happy to uh, pay more money. Yeah, yeah, and another. Uh Another uh, or you know concept I like to tell people is that um, 1964, before uh, silver was removed from the coinage, uh, so the uh, quarters, the quarters, dimes, and uh, half dollars were were 90 percent silver, right? And uh, 1964, the minimum wage was a um, dollar 25, right? So five. 90% silver quarters, right? So fast forward to today, minimum wage is seven dollars, what seven fifty, something like that. You know, average, yeah. Yeah, on average, and uh, and then and then you have to ask yourself in order to understand the difference between a dollar twenty-five in ninety percent silver quarters and seven fifty in uh, you know crap, <laughs> you know counterfeit toilet paper trash currency. Uh, you really have to realize how much does it cost to purchase. Uh, a 90% silver quarter today, right? So it's approximately, I mean, it's been going down recently, but it's approximately $4. For 2015 dollars to purchase one uh, 90% silver quarter, right? So you calculate that five silver quarters, right, would be, uh, five silver quarters in, in 1964 would have the approximate uh, purchasing power of like $20 in, uh, in 2015. <laughs> so basically, it's not the problem of, you know, it's not the employer's problem. It's not that they're greedy. It's not that they're exploiting, okay? The main problem is that the currency is hijacked, right? The yeah. currency is being destroyed by the, you know, the Federal Reserve, by the, by this, you know, you know, legal counterfeiting operations, quantitative easing, one, two, three, all this crap, all the bailouts, all that kind of stuff. It's being destroyed, right? And people are blaming their employer <laughs> for the fact yeah. that their standard of living is going through the roof, you know? And a, a healthy education in government, in, in the, what the Federal Reserve is, in Austrian economics, can remedy all of that, in my mind. Yeah, and it, it kind of goes back to it, you know? People, instead of people looking internally, they're looking externally, right. you know? Who can help me? Who can fix my problems? So people, like I said, people, people, people are the government, you know? They, you know, they, they, they 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 want them to uh, you know provide a solution for them so they don't have to worry about it. But at the end of the day, like I said, you know it's their problem. It's not the government's problem. But a lot of people tend to result to uh, going to the government for that. But see, this is the solution. And, and in order in order to uh, get away from all that, uh, people need to think differently. Okay, if they want to make more money, they need to think more strategically. Okay, so uh, there, so I, I have a, I have a uh, email series that I have a part of my newsletter. It's called "How to Upgrade Your Life Without Making More Money," and uh, it's, it's been very well received, very popular. And if people, if people uh, join my newsletter, uh, they can be able to uh, pick that up. But one way is expatriation. Uh, so uh, right now I am here in uh, San Miguel, uh, Mexico, and uh, there's a lot of business opportunities here that can be had that people can find. So in the U.S. it could be 
depending on what industry you're getting into, it could be extremely difficult to start a business. You have to worry about permits, certifications, licenses, oh, yeah. regulations. Uh, depending on what industry you get into, you can wait up to a year before your business actually gets started. Yeah. You know, in places down here, uh, like uh, here, like Mexico, where uh, there's there's almost no regulation, you can start your business within like a few days. You, know, you could just you know you could just you could just rent out uh, a commercial storefront. Uh, oh, and you're in business. You know, you know, no one's going to bother you. No one's going to hassle you or anything like that. So that's one option. Okay. Another option is by uh, domestic migration, and where a person moves to a state that's more, I guess, uh, more uh, pro-business, mm-hmm. more uh, liberty, liberty friendly. Uh, mm-hmm. Some people like New Hampshire. They they like that. They like up there. Uh, you have you have other places that are pretty pro-business, like Delaware, uh, like Wyoming. Uh, like Las Vegas, you know, they're very pro-business states. Um, so, so that's another option, okay. And the last option is to just, just you know, be self-employed, employ yourself. You know, find something that you're good at, or you can become good at that you can do, that that uh, that will actually allow you to work from anywhere you want to. You know, so for example, if a person is very good at photography, okay, well they can use those services, have a website, and they could be able to sell those services uh, via the internet. Okay, or if it's website design, they can do the same thing: programming, coding, uh, graphic design, whatever it is. You know, that's another skill. So those those are three different ways, and where a person uh, can upgrade uh, their lifestyle without making more money. Expatriation, you're going to save money because most countries the cost of living is cheaper. You look at Mexico, you look at Colombia, uh, you look at uh, Romania, look at those countries, much cheaper. So you're going to have a higher quality of life with low cost of living. Uh, domestic migration, you go if you live in California. You can move to a place like Texas and save a whole lot more money. You know, you'll probably get the same house for for, for much cheaper, and you'll get a, a higher quality of life. And then at the same time, uh, the, the the final one is if you become self-employed, well, you save quite a bit of money because you don't have to worry about ch- if you have kids, you don't have to worry about child care costs. Uh, you don't have to worry about commuting costs. Uh, a lot of those different costs. You don't have to worry about you know eating out all the time because you're at home. So those are a lot of different ways that people can save money, so they can be able to, like I said, upgrade their lifestyle without making more money. But again, if a person really is really into money, they have to make so much money because that's their fantasy or whatever. Like I said, there are lots of employers that will be happy to uh, pay more money and offer you those type of positions. Yeah, it's, it's a good uh, point you brought up about um, uh, migration. You know, it's like basically voting with your feet, right? So if, you're, if you live in a place that's very oppressive, you know, so many laws and regulations, permits, licensures, uh, taxes, you know, that hamper the small business entrepreneur, then you will vote you will vote with your feet by moving to a place where it's more business friendly. And, 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 and the same goes with uh, um, like if you already have an established business and you move the business to another country, you know, let's say a tax haven, which which people constantly, constantly vilify, like, you know, those evil capitalists, like moving their businesses, you know, closing down a plant in the United States, moving it, you know, building it in Mexico. You know, they're destroying local jobs. They're they're stealing from the people who live there. Like, well, why do they want to do that? Like, it's, you know, just imagine how much expense and how much cost it requires, first of all, to shut down your operation and then open up another one over, let's say, over an ocean away. You know, that's in a massive amount of cost. And so in order for uh, for um, an entrepreneur or an employer to think that that's, that's going to be uh, beneficial for my business, I think that there has to be a massive amount of taxes and regulations that's destroying his company that's making it so so difficult for him to function that he's saying you know what it's a better option if i go across the ocean <laughs> yeah. if i leave this place that's better than if i stay here and people people think no they just they just, they just want to steal the job no <laughs> they want to yeah. they want to make they want to continue their business but they can't because they're being hindered for sure, uh, a lot of car, a lot of car manufacturers are, uh, are are building plants in Mexico because it's much cheaper right, than right. the U.S. Uh, right. It's just it's just not it's not business friendly at all, right. uh, as you spoke about. So it's just it's just it's common sense. It's practical, you know. It's 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 what you need to do to sustain your business. But uh, but yeah, most people don't see it that way. And uh, like I said, there's there's always going to be uh, skew politics in that. Yeah, yeah, and uh, and the other thing, the way I look at uh, certain countries is that like certain countries, you know, have a pretty high standard of living um, because of you know previous uh, you know freer markets, and now they're slowly becoming more and more oppressive and strangulated with their all the laws and regulations, like just like the U.S., like many of the European countries, 
um, like in the, yeah. in the eurozone, and they're slowly going downhill as a result, right? People are leaving, yeah. people are be leaving, businesses are leaving, and they're going to tax haven, you know, business friendly places like Mexico, like you know, let's say like the, uh, you know, Vietnam or Thailand or Cambodia or you know Hong Kong maybe, and and so those places are the opposite. They're actually on the rise. <laughs> yeah, they're they're becoming more and more prosperous, more and more wealthy as you know the other places with the really uh you know the 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 bureaucracy that's just on you know all the red tape that's just you know slowing right. it's like molasses you know it's just slowing yeah. slowing the uh the economy down so much and and uh and the people wonder you know what's going on why why <laughs> yeah <laughs> why is the standard of living going up but nobody wants to be here <laughs> they, you yeah. know, the government is just uh trying to steal from the people and the businesses that are creating the wealth so much that people are leaving <laughs> yeah, the, the 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 only the only countries and where that system works as far as the high taxes and regulation and all that uh, is the Scandinavian countries. But when you look at those, we look at that area. Uh, they have been historically and culturally like that. So for them, it, it, for them, they're used to that. It's it's, it's not it's not um, like the U.S. Was, the U.S. was founded and boarded on capitalism, mm -hmm. and they're trying to try to make a huge shift. It's going to take hundreds of years before everyone gets on board with that, you know. But the reason why countries like you know Scandinavia, I mean, personally, you know, it works for them. You know, I'm not a fan of their model, but mm -hmm. it works for them, and they're happy. Mm -hmm. So I don't have a lot of uh, uh, Nordic friends uh, yeah. uh, in, in there. But uh, the reason why, because uh, uh, a, a lot of times people say, "Well, hey, it works in it works in Norway. Why can't it work here? It works in this country. Why can't it work here?" But see, they don't see the underlying cause of that. Like, mm -hmm. like you know, those countries have had a history, have had a culture of that, mm -hmm. and that's why those countries have became like that. Um, uh, like I said, it's like it's not like the U.S. and where U.S. was born on capitalism. You know, mm -hmm. like I said, uh, that's just, that, that's just the way it is. You know, but um, like I said before, um, it's not for. Is uh, the, the whole thing about government is, you know, you vote for you, you vote for you vote for somebody, you know, you have some ideas, you vote for somebody, but now you're forcing your ideas on all these other bunch of people that didn't vote for that, mm -hmm. you know. Yeah. So like I said, it's just when it, when it comes to being an entrepreneur, or when it comes to just making money, it's just better just to go your own way instead of trying to you know use the government as a force to try to represent your beliefs. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. As, you know, democracy is founded on violence. You know, you, you're voting yeah. to subjugate your neighbor, right? You, you're yeah. trying to impose your beliefs on him. You know, by you know through your representative, or or if your representative loses, you you know your neighbor imposes their beliefs on you, and it's just yeah. it's just all about violence. And it's, it's it's you know people think you know that's civilization. No, actually, that's uncivilized. That's that's barbar that's barbaric actually yeah you know you know i tell people we're still in the dark ages right because we yeah. we still believe in this you know medieval violent uh and oppressive system called government and we think that people need and without it you know that people think oh people are gonna you know rape and kill it and murder each other uh you know without end and uh <laughs> it's gonna be chaos but but the nah. thing about the thing about it is you it, you know, as long there is voting involved, you're always going to have unhappy people. Okay, so Democrats get right. voted in office. Okay, now Republicans are upset. Okay, Republicans get voted in office. Now Democrats are upset. You know, <laughs> see that's the problem with like, like, like how about creating a system where almost everyone can be happy? But yeah. no, it's these, it's these two parties. Like I said, when one party gets in, these group of people are unhappy, right. and vice versa, the other group of people are unhappy. You know, how about just how about just create a system, like a voluntary system, and where everyone can be happy? But like I say, you know, unfortunately, um, uh, most people don't think like that. But uh, maybe, may, maybe soon, maybe eventually. Yeah, and and basically, in a democracy, when people realize that, you know what, if I vote to get more free stuff, then I'm gonna keep go voting to get more free stuff <laughs> to steal. If I can vote to steal his stuff instead of me producing it myself and creating value. And people voluntarily wanting to buy from me. If I can just vote for this politician and he's going to give me free stuff because he's going to steal from that guy, everybody's going to want to do that. Everybody wants free stuff, right? Nobody wants to to work because that's the hardest thing. Like you said, it's that's the lazy part. Is you know when you appeal to your to your politician or to government to do stuff, you 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 want free stuff basically, right? And that free stuff has a cost. Somebody produced it, right? And that's the problem. That's how most you know representative democracies collapse because you know this kid you know heavy burden of you know socialized medicine socialized educations you know socialized uh you know retirement funds pensions all this all these things are like again like molasses just just weighing down the economy weighing down the people who are actually creating the value that the government is stealing from <laughs> yeah 
Yeah, it's 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 uh it's it's ridiculous, yeah. but um, but uh, unfortunately, uh, it 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 appears going to keep on persisting because people continue to support it, which right. perpetuates the system. Right. And as long as people continue to do that, then uh, that's always going to be the issue. Right. And like I said, it always go back. People need to look in here mm -hmm. rather than out there. And right. if they look in here first, um, you know, they can have better perspective of how you to go about their lives. You know, for example, if a person is not making more money, okay, maybe it's because. You know, they're always going out drinking. They're always going out partying. You know, or they're yeah. always going to the movies every week. Or they're always buying a new video game. You know, you know, you know. It's 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 it has nothing. To, it's not always because their employer is not paying them enough. Right. It's because they're they're mismanaging their money. Mm -hmm. You know, and since they're mis and since since they're mismanaging their money, and, and instead of them kind of fixing their money habits, they'll say, oh well, well it's not fair. I'm worth more. I want to get paid fifteen dollars an hour. That's not the solution, you know. A, a lot of people uh, are taking responsibility for their actions, right. and they rather expect the government to bail them out. It's the same thing with the banks, mm -hmm. you know. When the banks, uh, when, when, uh, when the when the banks fell, they wanted the bailout, you know. Mm -hmm. Same thing with human beings, you know. Mm -hmm. You know, they want to bail out as well too because they don't want to take responsibility for their actions, you know. Uh, often, often. Uh, of course, I'm quite sure employers can pay employees more. Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah, you know, you're gonna make an argument about that. But at the same time, I would I, I would go on to say if a person managed their money better, I'm quite sure they could save more money mm -hmm. and they can maybe can invest that and accure more wealth mm -hmm. rather than uh, banging on the government's door expecting to get a raise uh, mm -hmm. for fifteen dollars an hour. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, <clears throat> but uh, Ken, I don't want to keep you too long. So um, so why don't we uh, finish up and can you can you give uh, the people again your uh, you know the uh, the websites and links and, and and places they can contact you if they want to follow your work. Yeah, for sure. Uh, so that newsletter I talked about, uh, people can uh, get my, uh, go to reachandfinishline.com uh, to get my free newsletter and have a lot of valuable information. We spoke about in, uh, in this episode about how to upgrade your life without making more money. I have a, all, I have, I have a lot of also uh, great uh, newsletters that is only available to my subscribers, so you can pick it up there. Um, I have the podcast. Uh, uh, that's at reachandfinishline.com forward slash podcast. And I have interviewed a lot of interesting guests, people from Shark Tank, uh, Shai Reshev, which we talked about before, the uh, president of the first uh, tuition-free accredited college in the U.S., uh, Matthew Lesko, uh, Bethany Marshall, um, that's an ultimate fighter, and a lot of other uh, interesting people um, as well. So they can, uh, they can find more at uh, reachandfinishline.com. And they can follow me on social media, Facebook, Twitter, uh, follow my YouTube, and that. Yep. Excellent. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you very much, Kellen. I really appreciate it. So, uh, so people, please stop uh, blaming other people for your shortcomings. We've got to take some self-responsibility, take some, uh, become self-reliant, independent. That's, uh, I think that's the spirit of a true uh, prosperous economy, <laughs> right? The, Absolutely. It's founded on the, on, the, on the hard work. And the uh, and you know the blood, sweat, and tears of uh, people willing to put their neck on the line, right? <laughs> to, right. Ser to serve their fellow man. So, right. And that's the whole core message of reaching the finish line. Is first you have to do is take responsibility for your actions, and and, and, if, and until you're able to do that, you won't be successful. Excellent, excellent message. Thank you very much, Kalen. Uh, great talking with you. Uh, so this is uh, so actually, if you want anybody wants to donate to my. Um, my uh, website or my my uh, YouTube channel, uh, except uh, Bitcoin, PayPal, um, and also Patreon. I finally got my Patreon uh, uh, account uh, put up there, so uh, I'm still working on it, but it's live. So anybody who wants to throw me some, uh, you know, uh, counterfeit confetti uh, Federal Reserve notes, I'm uh, would be most appreciative. <laughs> but uh, yeah, or or, or uh, precious metals, if you if you're so inclined to do to donate gold and silver, you can try the USPS. I don't I don't trust the black hole that is the USPS. But you are if you're willing to take the risk, I'm uh, willing to try as well. <laughs> so awesome! Thanks a lot, Kalen. Uh, really appreciate All right. the talk. So this is peaceful anarchism on the Voluntary Virtues Network and theconsciousresistance.com and thusseedsofliberty.com. Wishing everyone have a wonderful day. Take care. Bye.